Welcome into another Lansing Lugnuts Friday Conversation. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler, joined now by former Lansing Lugnuts General Manager, St. Patrick Day. Hey, what's really going on, Jesse? You. Yeah. So you were at Lugnuts GM starting in 2007. And I remember because I was with your Montgomery Biscuits when you were a biscuit and you left the biscuits to accept the position in Lansing. How was it first arriving in Lansing, Michigan? Um, it was crazy. And first off, yeah, that I was trying to think about this last night when we were messaging each other about doing this. When, when did I first meet you? 06? 2006. So that was the, the one championship ring I've ever won in my 19 years of being in front offices was that 06 Biscuits team. Jesse. So you're my good luck charm. I think my winning percentage as a general manager, which obviously people that no minor league baseball. No, it doesn't matter. But I think it's like 41%. I, I, I do not have an impressive resume winning percentage. But and, um, but yeah, um, that, you know, six. And then Lansing, to, to, to answer your question, I, I remember when I got the job. It's the first GM job. It's a funny story. Um, it was in early, late January. Late January, there was a Patriots and Colts playoff game it might have been the AFC championship game and I think it's the one if I remember that um that um somebody fumbled on the goal line for the the ball it got killed dead and then and the Patriots went in and scored um so Sherry I just settled down I was living in Montgomery we had just bought a house like six months before all comfortable I'm in my little man room Literally five minutes before kickoff, kickoff is Sherry. And I'm like, no. All right. I love her. Sherry, if you're watching this, I love you. I went, no. I'm like, I want to watch the game. Ten minutes later, Sherry again. Not like, no. I'm not, you know, like, I can't. It's Sunday. Then the third time, I'm like, this must be serious. It, so I took the call. And, yeah, um, my predecessor took a great new opportunity for him, Jeff. Um, and she asked me if I wanted to be the general manager there. And that's how the phone call went. And then it was a whirlwind because I had a pretty big job down there. Um, Montgomery was really ticking at that time. And I was essentially running all the revenue and Greg was running all the expense side of the business and um, um, on the ground, obviously, Sherry and Tom were running it overall. But um, I, um, I traveled back and forth for like three weeks. Like right now I look back on, I was such an amateur. All I do is travel for a living. Now I travel when times are normal, 100, 150 times a day, but I was a disaster. I'd, I'd drive from Montgomery, go to Birmingham, fly to Detroit, drive to Lansing. And I was split my weeks for like the first month. The season was getting going, um, get my feet under me and then moved up there. And um, it was great. And, Pretty funny. Um, 2007 was my first year there, and for all the old school GMs out there that and people that have been around minor league baseball, that was really the last like huge, huge year for minor league baseball. 2007, right before the Great Recession hit, and things changed, and it was glorious. And then, and then, then the Great Recession started ticking. Let me ask you about something that took place in 2007 for the first time. You were there for the very first Crosstown Showdown. Crosstown Showdown. I, I cannot take um, credit for creating the event. Je J Jeff did the deal, and Tom um, with Michigan State. Like I said, I started in Jan or in February, so it was already um, it was already in the works. I mean, not much had fully been. been we knew there was going to be a game, and there was a logo created essentially at the time and it was thought at that time that it was gonna be it was on a tuesday okay because the lug nuts used to open on a thursday and the expectation was like 1500 people Jesse, for that thing um and it was not a big number that anybody was expecting we had a nice little deal in there where it was a fundraiser for the michigan state baseball program um, which didn't have a huge budget at the time. Um, and it was a big deal to their kids. Um, it, was a big deal. it was a big deal for Michigan State because technically in those, they had to take a game off their schedule. 
there's a certain amount of games that you can play in order to win the college world series if you will you can't play any more than those so you have to if you play an exhibition game you have to sacrifice that game so that was a big deal to them that they sacrificed one of their regular season games for it but we played it and i think we did okay um i mean thir- i think it was like 3500 was on tuesday it was cold it was in april um it she everybody's expectations and then I was going to talk about it. One of my favorite memories is a couple of those cross down showdowns. There's one, I believe, in 2010 that we had 12,000 people. It, biggest event I've ever been part of. And one of the funniest stories um, as, as you reflect back on stuff. And I remember this day like it was yesterday. We were humming on tickets. We were at like 9,000 when I went to bed the night before. Tom and I had a breakfast meeting with the publisher of the Lansing State Journal. Okay. So I went to breakfast with him. We come walking in feeling real good about ourselves. You know, we're going to sell out the game. We just got done with a good partnership meeting. Things are great. Jeff Jaworski, you remember him, right? Old box office manager. He immediately, he must have been looking out the box office window waiting for me to show up. Comes in my office where Tom and I. And he's, he's white. He's white as a ghost. And he goes, our server's dead. I'm like, okay. This is way before people really worried about technology. Greg, as you remember, was our old technology guy. And Kevin Thatcher did. And I barely knew what a server was. Like, it, it's funny to look back on that. I'm like, okay, what did that, did that work? You know, back then... Ticketing systems were not um, on 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 platforms. Okay, they were. Um, th- this was all server based. We lost everything that wasn't printed out, and couldn't sell tickets. So he estimate we got on the phone. It was ticket return. Okay, and Gordon Hirsch that used to own it. He was great. Got on the phone. We had like fifteen hundred people's names and will call. We had three thousand more tickets we're going to sell including lockup with no manifest no nothing and within like an hour we were operational we took POS's out of the concession stand set them up in the box office before Montgomery you're talking about my history I started in a box office in 1998 in Charleston West Virginia on old hand ripped tickets before ticket system so I knew that and Tom knew how to do it too and we created a virtual box office. So we had to do open seating. So we overstaffed on ushers. <clears throat> and I don't know if it still is, but it was the largest crowd in franchise history for a non-regular season game. I believe at that time it was like 12,000 something, right? So going back into the attendances, I believe this because <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at them right now. I believe this was 2009. Was it nine? Okay. So 12,992. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We sold over 250 kegs of beer. It was a Thirsty Thursday. A Thirsty Thursday, was, we were, it was rocking in Lansing. Like on a regular Thursday that wasn't a crosstown showdown, we would legitimately walk up four to 5,000 people. Like, I don't know if you remember those days. We, we every every front office employee would have 200 tickets, and if the kids got off the buses, they'd sell them like boom boom. We'd return them into the system and go. And, and we we walked up a huge crowd. That was legit. They were hanging off the flagpoles that night, and we didn't stop. Tom, this is a great debate. Tom and I always have. Tom just couldn't stop himself. I'd be like, I like you done. 300 more. 300 more, you know, and uh, you know, he could not stop himself that night. And we sold a lot of tickets. It was a, it was a crazy wild night. And the other piece of it, you got the score of that game? I sure do. 12 to 2, Michigan State won. Unbelievable memory for right? like, We got that going on, and Clayton was our manager, and the locker room was somber. We had some prospects on that team, if I remember, too. Um, some really good players. Yeah, spanked by Michigan State. And we can say it now. It's a decade later. I go down to see Clayton, our manager, just say, hey, say thanks, you know. Class, 
super classy dude. He he did all the post game stuff great and said said the right things and um farm director was Dick Scott and all I heard when I walked into Clayton's office was we did what? We lost what? Like <laughs> Yeah, so that 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 was a that was a night I wanted to make sure I got in. That that that, that was a special one, that, one that, that I'll never forget. Do you know that that's the second largest crowd in the history of the ballpark? The okay. first largest crowd was the 2012 Crosstown Showdown, your last Crosstown Showdown. Yeah, that one was big too. Um, I had. <laughs> Sold a lot of beer that night. I, I had I had some people in the community a little, little riled up. I think um, that one that 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 was a that was a big one. That do, you, yeah, that was big. Um, that was Mike Redmond's year, right? No, that was John John, John Tamargo's first year as a manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's good stuff. Those crosstown showdowns were were legit and. Um, I mean it like it was it was not created to be this monster revenue making thing that it that it turned out to be for everybody. Michigan State University too. I mean, we're cutting them pretty healthy checks that they were super grateful for and um it was great. It was a great partnership. A lady named Shelly Applebaum, who I know he's not with Michigan State anymore. Um Ron Mason was on the original contract. The one that did the deal. He was the AD at the time. So he's the one that signed the deal. That's before Mark became the AD there. Um, so Ron's the one that signed the contract and Shelly's the one that helped execute it. And I worked with her every year that um, that that I was there. She, she was special to me. I want to go back to what you said about 2007 being the last really great year for minor league baseball and then. And then we hit yeah. the recession. And then the bubble burst. And so I arrived in 2009 and I arrived into a Lansing where I'm seeing boarded up buildings and um, factories shut down and schools shut down and churches shut down. What was that like? And how did you get through that with the lug nuts? Yeah, um, it's an interesting one. I thought about it. I, I think all of us that, are, that have been professionals for, for a long time look back at different jobs that, that we've had and different roles and 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 how we handled them and, and worked through them and that's one of my prouder ones um in 2007 i was 32 years old so fairly young um all i'd done is minor league baseball so i'd already been in the business for 10 years so i knew what i was doing but still 32 years old running a multi-million dollar organization with a with a virtually 100% brand credibility in, 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 inside the market, um, so it was a it was an awesome responsibility, um, and we were we were, everything was humming. Um, and then the economy just remember that fall after the 08 season, right before the election. There that that whole period, 33 years old, trying to grasp all this. I think it's just fact. I don't think it's even argument that there was no minor league market in the country that had a had so no minor league baseball market that the that the economy got hit as hard as Lansing, Michigan, especially early on during that during that car crisis that um, we forget about. I mean, we had we had three plants in town at the time, all running on three shifts, and I remember at the bottom. There was one plant, like the the Grand River one. I, you know, it's been a few years for me. I think Grand River one was down to like one shift. At the time unemployment was up over 20% in Ingham County. Um, people were hurting. Our partners were hurting um, because the car industry is the the backbone of that town. People, you know, um, and it's a proud, rich heritage. Um, it, it was tough. I mean. General Motors filed bankruptcy. That's 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 another one. Um, that I took that phone call. I think we can talk about this now. It's not any big deal. Um, February of 
geez, before 08 or 09, I think it was before 09. Um, my years mix a little bit, and shame on me, Don LaDuca Cooley, for not remembering the exact year. But um, I got a call from a bankruptcy attorney notifying me that General Mo that a bankruptcy judge allowed General Motors, when they filed bankruptcy, let them out of all their sports sponsorships. So I, I remember the conversation distinctly. It's like, it's not just you, it's University of Southern California, it's the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know why I remember them saying Oakland Raiders or LA Raiders, whatever they were at that time. I remember, like, you just remember these conversations. I'm like, whoa, like, not good. But I had to call Tom and Sherry. And the city had been getting a call at the same time because at that time the naming rights deal was split. Um, um, so Eric Hart or Scott, I think Scott was in charge then. Yeah. Scott or Eric, one of those two got, got, got the call at the same time. And yeah, like I had to tell all, all these people were all of a sudden that much less rich than they thought they were for, I think they're like four or five year, years left on that deal. Um, it's a big deal to a team and, it's a real testament to that community. And I want to talk about this. I'll make sure we talk about this, but that went, so it went public. He warned me that it was going to hit the wires the next day. And sure enough, media picked up on it. Um, and we actually got out in front of it. I think, you know, we, we, we timed it to get a little bit out in front of it. Cause he warned us and hit the, hit the paper. It was all over the news. And I, I got like, seven or eight phone calls. I mean, some people thought maybe it only cost 20 grand, not, 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 not the amount it actually asked, but, um, met with Don, Don, Don and Jackson National Life. I mean, that was the middle of February and we had signage up all around the stadium for opening day. And I'll tell you a good story about the signs too. So, um, we, we got a deal done quick. They're they're both they're both fabulous. We both wanted to do it. Don was essentially done in the first meeting. I went over there and I remember going over there. I don't I know Cooley's moved now, but they had the offices over by the Capitol. His office was up on the top, and I literally looked down at the stadium, and he we were just staring at his window, and he's looking over the stadium and told him roughly what the numbers would cost and roughly what a package looked like. And then Sherry came in and 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 um work with Helen and and Terry Corella was very instrumental in that and um put a deal together and and it, it was great um so a lot of a lot of back and forth on what the sign would look like right the sign on the top of the stadium this is a great story it worked it's like a $50,000 sign, LED, double paneled, electronic, needs to go on top of the building. Um, I'll leave them out of it. Awesome guy, our sign company. So it had to get manufactured in Michigan, but not in Lansing. Then had to get shit, then like driven on a big flatbed tractor trailer. Um, well, apparently around the ballpark, you know, what is it? Larch and Cedar and Cedar is the one over by the food office, right? Right. Yeah. So you had to go up Cedar. Oh, oh turn, so, no, no, no. Uh, Larch. Larch. Yeah, okay. So it went up Larch, turned the corner there, went down. When he turned the corner to come down to Cedar to pull in the parking lot, the sign fell off the back of the truck. We were set to have like a media, like nobody like can talk about it now. It fell. Thank God it was, it had a little bit of, like everything got repaired. Nothing ever went wrong. The sign guy, the guy who said he'd be responsible if anything ever went wrong. Talk about a phone call, right? I had just gotten to the office. I didn't notice it doing it. And it's one of those, like you just never forget. You're the, you, you do all that work to get that deal done in a short amount of time. and that happens right <laughs> it's a good story isn't it my lord <laughs> okay let me ask you about something else that happened that yeah. 
it was negative, but I'd never seen anything like it before. And that was in 2011 when the permafrost melted. Oh, that's right. I'm glad you brought this one up. So Mike Redmond's our manager, okay? So all of you, he had a short stint as a Miami Marlins manager, like a year, two years after he left Lance, something like, Whatever, good. Like, it's pretty cool. It's like, I got to congratulate a guy and get, like, we were still in contact then and, like, real dialogue and him getting a major league managerial job. So, Mike Redman, just done with, like, a 10, 11 year career with the Minnesota Twins. His first coaching managerial job at anything's in Lansing. Opening day. And those of you that know the lug nuts, you don't know if it's going to be 70 or if you don't know if it's going to be 20 degrees, right? No idea. We played the Crosstown Showdown on Tuesday. What year was this? 11? 2011. Okay. Uh, played the Crosstown Showdown on a Tuesday. And it was cold. It was real cold that night. And then um, there was a, you know, it was borderline freezing, but okay, but it was going to rain. I was kind of caught up in the, Game didn't put much like okay guys co- cover the field yes we don't want to screw up opening day take care of the field cover the field do it um well it got really cold um and enough rain had gotten on the field before they covered it that essentially what happened was when they put the tarp down it helped pull pull some moisture up and then on opening day it became 70 degrees so they were all out for early work once again vivid memory sitting in that conference room there that overlooks the field with tom nick once again just like the other crosstown shutdown feeling good about ourselves we're gonna have a great opening night thirsty thursday 70 degrees out we were we we're getting ready to kill it um Sometimes early work start two ish. They they, they 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 just started early work out there. Mike calls. Uh, it have been later. It's like three or four. Mike calls me. He goes, I think you got a a, a sprinkler leak, second base and underwater. And, like, what? and um, walk down to the field and poke and prod. Sure enough. Get the groundskeeper, ops guy, go turn off the water. So they, they go out back, turn off the water. Let's continue. And in our pure genius, it went pretty quick, started to worry about the game. And all of second base, like where the second baseman stands, not the bag, that oval area that second baseman hangs out at, majority of the time, pre shift, um, was flooded. So here I go. All we got probably four thousand dollars in mound clay and a bunch of turf. It's it's opening day. We're fully stocked, right? Start ripping up the field, mount packing the mound clay. But this started spreading. It kept spreading. It kept spreading. And Matt was our groundskeeper. He's watching this. He great guy. You know what I'm doing? He came to the realization probably an hour in that we had a that the field was defrosting in front of our eyes on opening day. And by the time the gates opened, it was a mosh pit. And there's nothing you could do. Um, The lady at the Detroit Tigers, she used to be the groundskeeper in West Michigan, friends with Matt. Heather, I think her name, I, I, I don't remember her name right now, but she was tremendous and even drove down and was like, yeah. There's nothing you can do. You just got to let nature take its course. Not enough materials, not enough anything. It happens. This is why major league teams buy field blankets. So if you ever see these teams out there with field blankets, like Lambeau Field and all that, this is the reason why they do it. And um, we lost a whole opening weekend. Not only did we not play Thursday, not only did Tom, <laughs> he got, so he likes Mount Gay Rum. And Brett with our food had it sitting in the suite. I, I remember this, like Tom Tom had to get in front it's all college kids in there. We let him in, we let him start partying. Um 
and we've canceled it. And um, he um, gets on the microphone and says, unfortunately, we can't play. Goes up to his suite, poor guy, pours himself a drink, and he's like, I can't believe I just got booed in my ballpark. Felt so bad for him. Yeah, we lost that whole weekend, though, that, 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 that entire weekend series. So I had to go there. And it was nice. All it was like in the sixties and seventies all weekend. We had to like show up, and fans were coming to games. Like this is before social media was as big as it. It was big, but I mean, what do we have? Twenty thousand followers, and you guys probably got like eighty now or so. You know, like like the reach wasn't what it was, and we had people coming. We had to sit there and try to explain to them why 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 we couldn't play. That was a low moment. That um, that 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 one that one hurt the psyche. Did you know that that same exact thing then happened to the Great Lakes Loons a couple of years later? Yeah, I I I, I believe it. There, um, never heard of it in my life prior to that. Um, and I believe it. Jim Jaraki, my friend, he's uh, runs the Whitecaps in West Michigan. We were playing them, and he's like, "Oh yeah, it's, you know, he'd been in Michigan for." 15, 20 years longer than me. It's like, yeah, we, we own a field blanket. <laughs> so I was like, ah, yeah. So, so I learned a lesson the hard way. Right, that, these have been some negatives. Yeah. What were your favorite memories as Lugnuts GM? Yeah, I got, I got some great ones. Um, I think first and foremost, and I know people in our industry probably say it, but the, the Lugnuts brand is off the charts inside inside that market radius. Um, it's I I don't know what the numbers are, but Jesse, you've lived there for a while. Um, it's a um, it's got to be a ni- high ninety percent brand recognition. Like like every and everybody loves the Lugnuts. Like like. Everybody loves the lug nuts. That's that's the number one thing that I can that I think of, and I think about the incredible sponsors there um, a lot, and the real dedicated season ticket holders. Sponsors have been with that team for 25 years, supporting it incredibly. Like, I'm not going to get into numbers, but there's a really good group of sponsors and people there and the brand recognition and to be part of that um the greatest thing i've ever done in my career i i you know i i got probably 30 40 more years left to go but um it it was it it, it was fun and talk on that that branding thing um you'll appreciate this you know tom well and his leadership style he, he leads big picture and um and it's the reason why i think the brand is so strong during that time i was flying back and forth from montgomery to lansing and get my feet wet he was in town for a weekend and we went over to the the exchange down there we and he liked to smoke a cigar there then we go to dinner and he pulled out a envelope and he goes patrick this is your, I want to explain something, your job description to you. I'm not going to write up a detailed job description. And he pulled out a lug nuts envelope with a piece of letterhead and he folded it. And he goes, you see this logo? Um, sorry, somebody tried to call me. You see this logo? This is your job, protect this. And I believe everybody that's worked for that organization in 25 years acts that way. And that's why the organization's brand is successful as it is. So those, those are great memories. Those crosstown showdowns are great memories. Um, the front office employees, the friendships I've made, um, um, and just, just incredible. It's, it's mostly the people, I guess, Jesse. I, then, but it's not the the tactical stuff is blocking and tackling and part of our industry. And you know, a lot of big crowds, a lot of 
you know, a lot of awards we won over the years and just a, a lot of, a lot of that pride. But I think of Lansing, it, it's, it's the people and how genuine everybody is in that market. It was such a joy for me and a memory of your tenure in Lansing that I never knew when you were going to suddenly sit down next to me in the broadcast booth and broadcast the game with me and join me on the air. Uh, I loved it. My degree is in communication. So <laughs> that's why I, I, you know my original title, right? The 1998 Charleston Alley Cats as the Assistant Director of Public, Public Relations. And then all I did was sell and I wrote post-game press releases. But so I did, Jesse, and you, you were a joy. What, what are some of your memories? You got any funny memories of me managing and lead, anything good for people? Uh, <laughs> With you, you have next few, I, I, <laughs> I remember once we were playing a day game and you looked over at me and you go, you're a single guy. What are your plans for tonight? I'm going, on air, here's the pitch. <laughs> What, what, what was that about? I didn't just just check in with you. Oh yeah, checking you're just checking in. You. Um, I do a lot of that, right? Like, I remember when you went in the 2009 season when you went for a trip to the Midwest League All Star Game with Brian Van Kirk. Wow, oh, this guy, this guy was classic. All, all he would ever say is, "You." There are two people in it two types of people in his world, and I hope he's watching this. You either hit bombs or you didn't hit bombs, right? Yes. Brian Van Kirk. Okay, go. So that was 2009. 2010, we had Sal Fasano. Well, 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 the other one in nine, on a Brian Van Kirk All-Star game, Henderson Alvarez was there, who made it to the big leagues. We had to drive Nick, myself, Brian Van Kirk, and Henderson Alvarez. Henderson Alvarez literally didn't talk all the way down there. Didn't talk at all. Uh, he was the greatest guy ever. We talked on the way home, but didn't say a word. He and I would lean against the dugout railing before a game, and he would point at women who were in the stands, and then the two of us would look at each other and smile. And then he'd point at a different woman. I just remember. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He was great. Good uh, curveball. So 2010 with Sal Fasano and yeah, Lugna. Fun guy. 2011 was not only Mike Redmond, but it was Jake Marisnik, and it was a team that went all the way to the Midwest League Championship Series. Wow. You wanted another bad one? Yes. The, this is a memory. And – I'm not meaning to be negative because there are funny stories now, like, like they're hilarious now. So my memory of that Midwest League championship is awfully marred. So what happened in like late July, we had our tarp down and apparently the sprinkler system went off, okay, underneath it. Nobody wanted to tell Pat, right? No, they just wanted to solve the problem themselves. And there's a risk when that happens, I get a fungus. You know how humid it is, and, and the spray didn't happen properly. And the infield got mowed, and the fungus got on the mower blades. Do you remember that infield surface for that chip? Like, and, and I uh, endured the whole month of August. Like, there was this swirl, and we didn't have... I think they're telling me you need like five or six days to resod, and we had like 20 games that month, and then we made the playoff. Like there was, I couldn't resod. I just had to sit there and absorb it. And I still remember what was that? We got swept, right? Like it was a three-game sweep, and played two games down the right, then one game at our. So we played one but game in our. Two in Lansing, one game in Quad Cities. Okay, okay. So the first game in Lansing, then we're getting ready to play. And that man, it was, yeah, it was Quad Cities. I don't remember the guy's name. Um, older Latin guy was their manager. Um, I, I remember talking to him distinctly. And I was, we had the tarp down because it rained. And we had just pulled the tarp off. And he was, like, just arriving in the ballpark, getting normal. 
And I looked over at Nick, I go, let's watch his body language as his tarp gets pulled off. I want to see his face when he sees this infield. And I still remember the expression on this guy. This guy's like, he was probably one of the, you know, you know these guys, been been a baseball coach for 30 something years, right? And he was just like, like, like he he was in complete utter shock. That, that's a, that's a member. I remember just going to town like, yeah, like this is the deal we've been dealing with. And sorry. Another story about that Midwest League Championship Series was Quad Cities didn't allow its broadcaster to travel. Its broadcaster only did home games. But once they got him in the playoffs, they wanted him to travel. And I just remember after game one, I had left the ballpark. I'm driving home. And you gave me a call that. and you said, your boy's still here at the ballpark. He'd missed the bus. I remember that. I, I actually remember that. Yeah. Um, what are the good memories? Um, Pat, do you know yeah. who that broadcaster was and where he is now? Was it Tom Hart? His name is Tommy Thrall, and Marty Brenneman had him be his successor. He's now the voice of the Cincinnati Reds. Wow. Wow. I did not realize that. And I used to like to say hi to the broadcasters. I, the, the way that league was then, too, right? The Western Division only came in like once a year, right? So, yeah, I, 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 I didn't know him. And that's cool, though. That's great. It's a good story. So that's 2011, and then 2012 was the loaded team with tons of pitching prospects. And we just, oh. we were at We had JP Ricciardi and Alex, Antho or Alex Anthopoulos, like, driving limousines from Toronto down to Lansing. And that was a fun one because, yeah, it's a, that's a fun memory. So Noah Syndergaard, um, Aaron Sanchez and Justin Nicolino, right? He was the other one. He was in that big Marlins trade for what was that the R.A. Dickey deal back uh, in the day? Josh Johnson, Mark. Yeah, Martin. yeah, yeah, yeah. He Nicolino was in that, but he was thought of crazy. I mean, big kid. Like he was like Cindergard, he's a big kid, over the top, um, through through hard and. There was always the, the whole question from all that, the whole scouting community, which one would you keep? That's what it was. I remember Alex, like, Alex was reversed. Which one would you trade? And he was a smart guy. He was asking about personality. He was asking about demeanor, body, what type of body language I saw. The, those Blue Jays are another thing I want to make sure I – mention on this um along with the city of lansing too like the, the like blue jays are a tremendous partner and they're a tremendous partner to that organization i know charlie dick scott were the people that i dealt with back then um um great 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 people and like i said earlier in the conversations about people this right. brings us in 2012 up to your decision to leave the lug nuts. How tough was that decision? Um, it was hard. It was an interesting time in my life. I, um, I, we had just had our first daughter, um, Emerson, um, the year before. So trying to balance that. I, I burnt myself out. I mean, you, you know me and you can tell the people or like, I was closing the safe every, like, I was in there at eight. I was out of there at what, one? You remember? Now, I think you remember me. I was tired. Like, do you, I see pictures of me that year compared to pictures of me now. Oh, I, I, I was worn out. I was, I was, I was not healthy. Um, um, so that, that, that played a piece in it. Um, I was ready to spread my wings a little bit I, I i needed to i i'd worked for work for that so that company like you know i worked at the lug nuts the same people and tom and sherry they own the lug nuts and they also own that charleston team so i'd worked for them for 13 years at that point um and ready for a change it i, I, I think it happens in life and, and, and i did it and it's fun to go full circle and i've been working with tom and the president that, that division president of his um, food and beverage company um, and you know work with 30 plus minor league baseball teams and 
communicate with him still um, a lot, um, a couple times a week. So, so it, it's funny how things go full circle. But yeah, that, that was obviously a hard decision. I, I'd never, they're essentially what I'd worked for since I got out of college. Um, I, I don't regret it. Um, I don't regret many things in life and i i i i don't regret that because I, I definitely grew professionally I, I learned some opposite things i went to go work for some brands that were not the lug nuts brand and you, that's when i really appreciated the people in that market and the brand i'm not ashamed to say that um maybe i wish i appreciated them a little bit more at the time but i want to work some for some brands that might have had 20% brand identity and stuff like that, or a startup that I did that was hard to even build any, um, can't, 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 came to really appreciate that market. And um, it was nice to go back to that all star game. No one's that years are mixing, but two, two, two years ago, that was nice. I went to a couple events last year. I, um, I, for a year before I got this promotion, I technically oversaw the managers of your food and beverage operation there. Um, so it's good, 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 good times. Catch us up. What's your current title? I am the division president for professional sports catering. So essentially what that means, I report to the chief operating officer and the, the chief executive officer of the company and then have six people that report to me that manage regions across the country and the 35 operators. So mainly responsible for um, operation, you know, ma making sure that we're running efficiently, making sure that we're keeping our um, team morale up. I mean, it's really a big part of my job and then I hope I did a good job while, while I was there with you. I know I've grown as a leader, but try to, to try to lead people the the right way it's kind of what my job is and how's your family doing good 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 the, the girls are good we we love it out here in phoenix i i, I live in phoenix now um because originally when i went to work for psc i was I, I worked in fresno california for a year kind of went to boot camp tom told me that types of positions would be a real possibility um, but I need to go on the ground because I'd never actually done the groundwork. So I went out to Fresno, California for like eight months. Um, family stayed back in Connecticut at the time. And I went and jumped into the food and beverage business and then moved to Phoenix a year later and um, and um, um, oversaw the West Coast. And we got a couple of spring training properties, which I, which I have very direct reporting over i mean i'm heading to one right after this for a meeting so i got my jacket on um but yeah I, I i love it i've since i left lansing i lived in um lived in muskegon michigan for a very short time and then moved to waldorf maryland and ran a um, independent league team which signed a bunch of former lug nuts uh, michael kraus most notably was there um but but bunch of good people in, the, in that league and then went to New Britain, Connecticut, did a startup team for a year and then went to Fresno and I've been in Phoenix. Um, probably continue to progress in my career. I'm, um, I'm a guy that, that likes to have, like, likes challenges. I'll put it that way. Lastly, you said that you wanted to make sure that you mentioned the city of Lansing. Yeah, that, that's a whole nother relationship that um, I'm, I'm really proud of and and something that, um, as you talk about legacies being in buildings, um, I got there. So so I was there at an interesting time. There, the relationship, and it was public, so I don't really say it was pretty contentious between the city and the team for a decade like the first decade of that franchise it, it it wasn't great um the year before i got there tom got into a pretty contentious lease negotiation with the city H had to had to redo the deal and that was another thing like the deal had got signed i didn't have any piece in negotiation of it but here's the new lease 
right? Like it got signed like four months before I got there. Um, and I think you could ask anybody at the city, Scott, Eric, the mayor, Brig Smith, who is the city attorney, um, that at least what my role was and the general manager's role in that organization, I did a really good job building and cultivating that 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 relationship. Um, as I look back on legacy, I think it was a nice um, bridge because the year after I left, the relationship was so good. There was a huge investment put into that facility. 20 plus million dollar renovation. That was another thing too. I was tired, okay? I was tired and I knew that was coming. You didn't know, a lot of people didn't know. I knew and I was tired. And I didn't know if I had that left in me either, Jeff. So that's another reason why I, I, um, I thought it was best to leave. Pat, it was great for me personally working with yeah. Montgomery and Lance. You too, man. And Pat Day from 2007 to 2012, Lansing Lugnuts general manager. Thank you for sharing your memories. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. And um, I know I got a lifelong friend with you, and you know what you're doing. I. I, I hear stuff. I was extremely grateful. I did your top five um, mentors in the business thing like six months ago, and I made that list. And that was one of my happiest memories of 2019. So you do some little things. That's the stuff that makes leadership worth it. So thank you. It means a lot to me. He's yeah. got day. Take care, man. This has been our Friday conversation. Oh, nice, bro, nice.